Welcome to season 15 of the Avely Road to Glory save here on the channel. And after finishing second in the Premier League, missing out on goal difference to the new most dominant team in English football, West Ham, it would appear, who retained their title. We now need to do a bit of squad strengthening, squad building and go again. And let's see if we can win the Premier League this time round. <music> OK, let's get into season 15. We've got a summer transfer window coming up. Leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel. If you missed the end of season review, we won't go through the whole thing, but Lorenzo Espirito Santo finishes their top goal scorer, 26 goals in all competitions. A 28-year-old Portuguese, only two and a half stars, but he was fantastic for us last season and the season before. 36 goals in 66 appearances is pretty decent going especially when you consider we paid how much for him i can't remember how much how much we paid for him now six million there you go i knew it was a bargain jörg lorenzi highest average rating for 7.14 and 13 assists actually got 13 goals as well like uh, this season in the league it was eight goals eight assists four player in the match awards at 7.04 from 37 goals so 16 Goal contribution of 37 games. He was incredible. He's a five-star rated wonder kid. Um, he's four stars at the moment. I really do think he will fulfil that potential. And yeah, it was a really good season. As you see by the league table over here, we finished second on 79 points. The joint level on points with West Ham, but they had a plus six goal difference compared to us. We were three points ahead of Manchester United. We will be playing in the Champions League again. And, you know, if we look at our performances in the Premier League since we've been here, we arrived in the 2032-33 season, surviving relegation by the skin of our teeth on 31 points. In the second season, we finished eighth on 61 points, so an improvement, massive improvement there. Then we finished fifth in our third season on 75 points, continuing our, our season on season improvement. Then in season four, we finished fourth with 72 points and last season second with 79 points. So we've improved year on year. So if we can continue that, then we will hopefully win the league this year. But you've also got to feel the likes of Man United, Man City, especially, especially Chelsea, Liverpool, Tottenham, Arsenal, that they've all got to be better than what they were next season. But we shall see. In terms of players that we've got at the club and players that will be leaving. So this is our first 11, if everybody's fit, basically, and our substitutes. The players down here in terms of you and Todd, Neil Lovell, Stuart Gill, Thomas Van Cara and Steve Hunt, they will all be leaving the club this summer. Their contracts expire, won't be renewing it. Thomas Van Cara is actually retiring on the 29th of June. And yeah, this is basically what we've got left at the club. Now, I've been looking at our squad because this is arranged in terms of expiring contracts. And as you can see, there's quite a few homegrown players in there. We need to make sure we can fulfil our homegrown quota. It does mean we've got seven players homegrown at the club, but it does also mean we will need to fill... We can only have a squad, really, of 24 if we're going to fit all of these players in. So... It's going to be tricky, it's going to be difficult, but we need to strengthen in a couple of areas. And the areas I'm really looking at is we need another centre-back. So we've got Carvalho and Nicholson as our one and two. Bedoya is our number three. After that, we have nobody else that can play a centre of defence. So we really do need a central defender. And again, I'm looking to bring in someone in that's three and a half, four stars minimum kind of thing, hopefully. Um, which would mean it would be a replacement for Bruno Carvalho. Um, I'm looking for an upgrade on our ball-winning midfield role. I think with Jörg Lorenzi, we've got an absolutely brilliant attacking playmaker or advanced playmaker in their midfield. But if we can just improve the ball-winning midfield role, Miguel Neto as a 20-year-old um, five-star potential wonder kid, he's had a really good season last season as he did the season before he's been improving each season 
and I'm quite happy with him there. And in terms of backup, the likes of Mutungur and Pratt, they can all play in that role. Backup wise, I think we're we're okay. I mean, McCausland is a good backup for Jurgen Lorenzi, as is Adam Bartlett. I'm probably going to look at wanting another striker as well because we've got Espirito Santo up top. Bartlett can fill in there as well, but I just feel we need somebody else. If we can get someone that's a striker that can play on the right-hand side when Anthony Geertz is injured, then that would be pretty decent. And that would probably be a business done this summer. In terms of what we have to spend, transfer budget-wise, incredible. We've got £80 million basically spent, £79.7 million. We've still got 150000 in the wage budget to spend. That will probably be a bit more once some others have left as well. So looking at the scouting side of it, let's have a look at players in range. We'll take off just the centre-back and just put it as all positions. And we'll filter it by our scout reports. And, I mean, straight away you've got this as an attacking midfield. We don't need that position um, you know, you've got Bondarenko at Birmingham, 40 to 49 million. He's in the Sky Bet Championship. Three and a half star current with four and a half star potential. He's very quick. He's got flair. He's good at off the ball. He's got great technique, great first touch. He can play left or right at three star. He can play up top at three and a half star. He's someone we potentially could look at bringing in. I don't know if I've actually tried with him before. But we've talked to his age. He's got a slight interest. We're not going to give us too much information. So he's actually Manchester United. They're going to want 38 to 47 million. Um, do you know what? We're putting an offer for him. We'll do it a bit on the never-never. So we're putting 20 million up front. They're going to want around 47 million. So if we do installments of 15 million, three installments... And then after 50 league games, we'll pay them another, say, 13 million. That takes up to 48 million in total. Let's see what they have to say about it. They want to negotiate it. They want 58 million plus the 30% profit of next sale. So if we can knock that down, because I don't really want to be paying over 50 million, really. So... I'm not prepared to have that in there. We'll take that out, see what they think now. And they've accepted it. Okay, so we may have a first player. That's Andrei Bondarenko, 23-year-old Ukrainian that was out on loan at Birmingham last season. Had a really good season. He was 21 goals in 36 games, including eight assists, seven player and match awards. The previous season is at Shakhtar, where he got 13 goals from 23 games. I actually don't know why United don't want to play this chap because he looks really decent and we could actually have a new out and out striker there. So yeah, I'm going to continue to look around. I'll see what we find and I'll bring you back if and when we have more information. So the first two signings of the summer are in. 23-year-old striker Andre Bondarenko, which you would have known about from earlier on in the episode. Three and a half star rating from the assistant manager. 35 billion £145,000 a week, that is the absolute limit that we can pay anyone is £145,000 a week. Potential for four stars, but looks pretty decent. I'm probably going to play him out on the right or left, probably the right as an inside forward. And then the other sign-in is Mataya Jovanovic, 20-year-old wonder kid, 6.75 6 million. That was his release clause, £30,500 £30. per week. He's a genuine wonder kid with four and a half star potential. He's rated at the moment as 23 to 31 million. We picked him up for six million, six and a half million. So he can play in the ball winning midfield role, which if we go back to our squad now, we can bring Bodnarenko and Jovanovic up onto our bench. And Bodnarenko, if we put him in there, is an improvement on Geertz. And Jovanovic, if we bring him in here, is an improvement on Mutungura. So great news to start off with. And let's see what else we can add during the transfer window. One other thing I will show you is on the club vision screen. I mean, it's saying here, what's struggling to work within wage budget. We're waiting for players to leave first. So that's not going to be 
an issue plus we are we can easily just adjust the transfer budget as well but there was something on here it's not showing oh here we go so it's from the supporters play counter-attacking football disappointed well hopefully the fact that we finished second in the league means you can stick your disappointment anyway in terms of finances we do have 137 million in the bank we are loaded that's before we get all the money coming for the premier league and champions league and all that sort of stuff so yeah i'm going to carry on trying to find some players i'm trying to get rid of leroy arias as well but nobody wants him so it might be another loan deal for him but yeah we really need him out of the club so i'll see you shortly for an update <music> Okay, so the next update we have for you, and it's not a good one, it's a really bad one. Jörg Lorenzi has gone to Liverpool for £70 million. That's probably our record out, to be fair. I'm just having a quick scroll through. I don't really know why I'm checking it, because it must be some sort of a record. Um, yeah, he, he's gone. <clears throat> Sorry, he's gone for £70 million. They met his release clause, basically, and... We had no, we had no choice. So Jörg Lorenzo did win the UEFA Champions League Young Player of the Year award. With us. I mean, look at that now. He's gone to Liverpool. And he's worth up to two hundred and twenty million pounds. I mean, this just shows how we are nowhere near in the realms of being able to compete with the likes of Liverpool and all that sort of stuff. Wish him all the best. He's had two great seasons with us. We bought him for 11.5 million, sold him for 70 million. That's really good profit. Nobody else has signed yet. We have released some players. Van Cara's retired and all the others that I said were going to go, plus a Ballinger, McGoldrick and McMullen, they've all gone as well. We are looking into bringing in a new director of football along with some other staff members, Sergio Herrero. I mean, 20 for judging ability, 19 for judging potential and 19 for negotiating. If we compare that with um, Kolorov that we had in before, it's not even showing me now. Where is he? Kolorov. Let me find Kolorov. We've got him here somewhere. There you go. Alexander Kolorov, 15, 15 and 7. So... Massive upgrade in that department. We have got the best coaching set up in the league. We've got nothing to do in that department. We've got the best physio in the league. I'd like to have another sports scientist so we could have that as well. And yeah, there's basically no more staff to bring in because we've got everyone we need. And I'm just going to roll it over to the next stage just to make sure that is absolutely accurate. But I am fearful we're going to lose some more players due to, oh, there you go, we've got one more physio, a head of sports science, a scout, the director of football we know is coming in, and that's it. So, yeah, I am a bit fearful that we could be losing some more, I mean, that squad looks very small right now, doesn't it? As we stand at the moment, we're waiting for, to find some more players, but we've got a squad of 21 at the moment. Leroy Arias also left us, I'm not sure if I actually showed you that, um, here you go, he's gone to Crystal Palace. My world's merged far too much. 3.9 million up front with rising potentially to 5.25. He'll probably be an adequate sign-in for them. And I'm now going to continue to try and find players, which at the moment I am finding it very, very difficult to get anybody. But let's see what I can unearth. Here's a season preview. We we're expected to finish 14th, and I think that could actually be quite a realistic expectation because I'm going into this new season not particularly hopeful. We've had players leave, players come in, we've had players unhappy because I can't offer them new contracts and it's just miserable. In terms of finances, 120 million in the bank, we've got no transfer budget. We had about 12 million remaining that to move that into the wage budget so that we're not over, I mean, we are comfortably under it now that I've moved it all. I mean, we need to have 1.472 million in there so we could, in theory, give us a little bit of wiggle room as well, do it like that so that we've still got £40,000 in the wage budget with £7 million in the transfer budget. If we wanted to give ourselves a little bit more wiggle room, 
Um, we could maybe do that where it gives us a hundred thousand pound in the wage budget, but only four point two million in the transfer budget. Looking at our squad, I mean, we go to transfers first, just so that kind of makes sense. So, in terms of players out, Ben Huggins was one of those wanting a new contract. I couldn't offer him what he wanted, he, and he also wanted a sell-on clause of twenty percent, which I weren't prepared to give him. So. He got unhappy. A load of other people got unhappy. We ended up selling him to Everton for 17.75 million. Don't mind seeing him go. He was a decent player, but it's not worth the unhappiness. In terms of who we brought in, Andy Mendoza for 36.5 million. 28-year-old Spanish player. Not international. He's mainly a centre-back, six foot three. Decent marking. Decent leadership and natural fitness. Plays as a centre-back not really a ball playing defender with passes of nine. 28 years old, we've now got a value of 51 to 56 million, so who knows, maybe a profit on him in the future. Then we brought in a wonder kid, Lansana Haber. Now, I was very surprised to get him because Real Madrid came in for him after we put in a bid for him, and straight away I just said, oh, well, there you go. We're not getting him because he's going to go to Real Madrid. But he didn't. He chose us. Three-star current with five-star potential. He wants to be a centre-back. At the moment, I'm going to be playing him as a right, as a left back because Fabio Nunes is out injured for a few weeks. So I thought we'd give him a start out there, see how he does. He's got great acceleration, agility, balance, decent pace and getting better. He's got stamina, aggression, good decisions, works his absolute backside off. So yeah, Antwerp and Belgium, in FM24, producing pretty decent players. Then we've got Luca Galina from um, Fiorentina. We paid 30 million for him. Oh, let's go back onto him again. Another centre back can also play at the right, out on the right. He could be quite useful, especially with Huggins going as well. He is more of a defensive right back though, because he can't really cross the ball. But he does have good agility and balance, anticipation, concentration, and he can head a ball as well. So that's quite handy to have. So in terms of our actual tactic, we've got players out injured already. Fabio Nunes, as I said, he's out for nine days to three weeks. Then Anthony Geertz is out for eight days to three weeks. And Tangai Trove is out for up to three months. He's one of them that's unhappy. He wants to leave because he's not getting a new contract. Um, I'm trying to find who... There's another one in here somewhere. Bedoya is keen to leave if someone comes in for him. I think that might actually be it, but... We are short. We've got a 23-man squad. I would prefer to have been able to fill the midfield role here. We've changed this from attacking playmaker to a box-to-box -box midfielder. Might not be the best of choices. We have players that do prefer to be an advanced playmaker, but I've just changed it for this season. Hopefully it works for us. We only have Bartlett as a backup striker to Espirito Santo. A Sandra can play there along with Bondarenko. But obviously having Trove out injured means we're going to end up short in this area. There's no point calling on a dev centre because we have absolutely nothing there worth looking at. But on the plus side, talking of the dev centre and youth in particular, facilities are being upgraded. So the youth recruitment is now good youth recruitment where it was below average before. And the youth facilities, which are currently adequate youth facilities, they are doing works on that, should be finished in November, so hopefully that'll take us up to good youth facilities, which is moving things in the right direction. In terms of the fixtures for today, if we go back far enough, let's just find the fixtures if we can. No, we can't. Okay, let's go to the competitions in the Premier League that gives the fixtures. We are in action today away to Bournemouth and yeah, Newcastle have played their first game of the season against Burnley, won that 3-0, I presume that was. Yeah, 3-0. So I'll bring you back in part two to see exactly where, where we are in the table. And I'm dreading it at the moment because I think this is going to be a tough season, especially if we get a lot of injuries. But I'll see you in part two. Okay, so before we get into the schedule and how we've been doing in the various competitions and stuff... As you can see on screen now, we've signed three young players, two 16-year-olds and a 17-year-old. They're not particularly good, but 
it's part of my quest to be able to get some homegrown at club players that we could potentially have in our squad. And I'm not sure this is really going to work out the way I wanted it to, but Jamie Pritchard, for example, is a 16-year-old midfielder. He's the worst one of the lot. He's not even got a gold star on his current ability, but he does have three star potential as a midfielder. could do the ball-winning role. Obviously, he needs to improve in several areas. But if we can go into his training, he's in our under-21s at the moment, and we don't want him as a central midfielder, do we? No, we want him as a defensive midfielder. So if we just change that to ball winning, or do we want defensive playmaker? But defensive, deep line playmaker is what we do. So we go for the deep, deep line playmaker role. We'll leave all that as it is and we'll change it when they feel it's necessary. Same with Charlie Woodrow. He's got one star for current ability, three stars potential. He wants to be a defender. He can play in the midfield. I think probably train him as a midfielder, so we're going to his development training. Ball winning midfielder on defend, that's fine. They're doing all that for us, so I'm quite happy to leave that as it is. And Reese Thompson is a young goalkeeper, 16-year-old goal, goalkeeper, one-star current, three-star potential. We'll leave him as he is, let them take care of the training. And yeah, the idea is that in two to three years' time, they will be homegrown at club and can at least fill out a bit of a gap that we currently have. In terms of, if we just go to player contracts for a moment, we have three players whose contracts are up for renewal. And Lorenzo Espirito Santo is one of them. Now, that's interesting because here it says has the ability to be part of their squad. When I looked at it, I mean, when did this email come out? A couple of days ago, on the 29th of December in game. So, yeah, two days previously. That said, absolutely no interest in signing a new contract. And I was like, oh, OK, so we're definitely going to be in the market for a new striker. Probably was going to be anyway. We might have to get two new strikers now. Geertz and McCausland, I've already decided we're going to let move on. They've outgrown their time at the club. But with Espirito Santo, if we can get him to stay, I'd actually be quite pleased with that. Because as you can see here, with 32 appearances, 19 goals, 34 appearances, 17 goals, and this season, 15 appearances, 10 goals. He's been really good for us. He's not the best in terms of his star rate, and he's three stars for both. But he's absolute. So let's have a look at his contract now. Let's see if we can... So now he's highly interested. That's very interesting, because like I say, he had absolutely no interest in talking to us. And he did have a wanted sign next to his name for um, a club in Saudi Arabia. So if we can tie him down to a new contract, four-year contract, I'm happy with all of that. We'll just finalise the deal. And £76,000 a week, we're prepared to pay him. It's a pay rise of 26000 In terms of player contracts and stuff, in part one, Tango Trove and Fabio Nunes were wanting new contracts and I weren't prepared to offer them what they wanted. They've come down with their expectations now, so they're now on new contracts. Trove is now contracted for four more years. He's on £97,000 a week. And Nunes is contracted for another two years and he's here on £86,000 a week. So that means with Dynamics, we have no issues with players. A team cohesion is very good. A club atmosphere is excellent and managerial support is excellent. In terms of finances, we had to remove all of our transfer budget into wage budget so that we had enough to not be breaching our wage budget. And then not long after that, the club came to me with one of those emails that says, um, we, we'd like to discuss club, like club improvements with you. And their club improvement was to raise the wage budget by 100,000. So... Yeah, we've got a decent amount left in the wage budget. £73 million in the uh, in the bank balance. Now, I'm talking of emails. I'm going to show you an email. I'm going to put it on screen around about now regarding our um, loan. We had a loan player or player that we're sending out on loan. If we have a look at it here, this one here, Renford Brannan, who's gone out. It doesn't say it here, but if we look on his contract details... He's on a work experience loan contract. I have never seen that in all the years I've played football manager. I've never, I mean, it, it may have been in there for the last 
10 years. I don't know. I, I, I've just not noticed it. But he's with us on a youth contract. So maybe because he's on a youth contract, they can't take him on a regular loan. But you can take a youth contract player on a work experience loan. Let me know in the comments if you've ever had that in your game because that's completely new to me. No, never, ever seen it before. And he's out of contract with us at the end of the, su uh, end of the season. We're not going to be renewing it. He looks quite rubbish, to be perfectly honest. But, yeah, oh, that was new to me. Anyway, let's get into the schedule because this is what you've came here for. And if we scroll up to the start of the season, we had Bournemouth, Burnley at the start of the season. And I, I said in part one that that's quite a nice little start. But then it gets tougher with Arsenal, Newcastle, Chelsea, West Ham, Brighton, Tottenham. You know, the, these guys, especially around here as well, with the likes of Man United, Villa, Juventus, Liverpool, Man City. And this proved to be a problematic point in the season because we started off with quite a disappointing 2-2 draw with Bournemouth. And it's the only draw we've had in the league this season. The only other draw we had was in the Champions League against Manchester United. And Manchester United and Manchester City, I'm absolutely sick to death off because basically we lose every time we play United and City. That one all draw there is a bit of an exception, really. Um, but yeah, we beat Burnley 3-1. We had a 2-1 loss against Arsenal. Then we went on a nice little run. Carwell Cup, we beat Newcastle 1-0. We then beat Chelsea in the league 3-0. Salzburg 4-2. Hibernian was the other Champions League game we played in that month 3-1. West Ham, who have fallen off a lot from what they have been the last two seasons, we beat 2-1. Then we had Brighton, which was our second league defeat of the season. We lost 2-0 to them. We then lost to Tottenham 2-1. And by the way, our home games in the Champions League, if we just look at this one a minute, this we had 34,000 fans here. It's not actually telling us where we're playing on here now. Where's the match? How do I see that now? Well, anyway, we have been playing at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. There's one of them here somewhere, this one against Manchester United, where we got 52,450 fans. That was the highest attendance we've ever had. And then back to the Tottenham Hotspur. No, that was away against Juventus. That was away against Copenhagen. But yeah, and then we played Feyenoord at home and we're back to Parkside with 6,125 fans. I really don't know what happens with our, with our Champions League games so Salzburg yeah Salzburg Tottenham Hotspur Stadium we got 34,000 then it was the Manchester United game back at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium 50 and look only just under 9,000 of those are away fans so 43,000 or whatever of them supporters are Avely fans that I just think that's incredible I really do but anyway we had a 4-0 win against Fulham we then lost in the Carabao Cup fourth round to Manchester United. I mean, the cup draws have been lousy to us this year. We've got Newcastle and then Man United in the Carabao Cup. We've got Leicester. We've drawn against Leicester in the third round of the FA Cup. Then we got a 2-1 win against Aston Villa 2-1. A 3-0 loss away to Juventus. A 1-0 win at home to Liverpool. Then a, a typical loss against Manchester City 2-0. Then we smashed Copenhagen 6 0. That was an incredible game. Then Newcastle, we beat 2 1 at home. And this was the start of a, an amazing run of games. I mean, you look at some of the teams we had the likes of Hull, Wolves, Leicester, Birmingham, Everton, Sunderland. They're, it's, a, it's a nice teams to be playing against. And we just picked up a lot of wins 2 0, 3 1, 3 0, 2 1, 3 1, 2 1, 1 0. We lost against Manchester United as per the norm. We will be playing Burnley later on today. And then, like I said, we've got Leicester in the FA Cup third round. We've got Real Madrid away and Bayer Leverkusen at home in the Champions League. And the way that sits at the moment, we're currently seventh. We're guaranteed to be in the blue part. We've had an email come through saying we've secured our playoff place. And with Real Madrid and Bayer Leverkusen to come, I mean, Real Madrid, we're definitely going to struggle against them. Leverkusen, I don't even know, Leverkusen all the way down here. So there is a possibility we could finish in the green area of that. We've got nobody in here to speak of, so we won't worry too much about that. In terms of the Premier League, if we have a look at the league table there, we are joint top of the Premier League. 19 games played, 
13 wins, one draw, five defeats. We've, our goal difference is much less than Liverpool's. Tottenham are one point behind. Man United are another couple of points behind with Chelsea following after that. After Chelsea, there is starting to be a little bit of a gap. Four points at the moment from Arsenal and then a couple more from Brighton. We do have Tango Trove in our average rating list for here. This guy here, Ayanaka Moldovan. He's a decent player. He's got his top of the assist charts as well. He's a right-sided wing of five stars, as you can see. Never in a million years is he going to be coming to us. But, yeah, you look at his league form. 13 goals, sorry, three goals, 14 assists out of 16 appearances. So 17 goal contributions from 16 games. He's been on fire. He's been regularly winning um, goal uh, Young Player of the Month award. If we just go to Liverpool as well, who are top of the table, of course, I want to have a look at Lorenzi. Let's see how he's doing. And if he's not been playing, I'm going to be cursing Liverpool. So in terms of the league, I mean, he has been playing 13 games, two goals, one assist, 6.79 after a £70 million move away from us. Yeah, he seems to be enjoying life at Liverpool. If we then just look at the rest of the table, West Ham, as I say, they've fallen off massively from what they were. They, you know, they've won it for the last two seasons, as you can see over here, but they're currently ninth in the table at the moment. Man City sitting in eighth. That's not good for them. Newcastle all the way down in 12th. In the relegation zone is Fulham, Burnley and Birmingham. So, yeah, that's pretty much all there is to show you for part two. So I'll see you in part three where we see if, can we win the league? Can we do well in the Champions League? Let's go to part three and find out. Oh, would you look at that. We got to the final of the Champions League and we lost 2-1 in extra time to Real Madrid. Now, we'll get to the teams that we beat in order to get to the final in a moment. First of all, what an achievement. I never thought we was getting to a Champions League final. And we came so close to winning it. If we have a look at the match report, st uh, stats-wise, it's all pretty even, really. We took the lead through Miguel Neto in the 37th minute, Bondarenko getting a an assist for us. They equalised in the 93rd minute. Then they scored again in the 95th minute, which was five minutes into extra time, of course. And... When that goal went in on 93 minutes, I was so deflated. I was so... I was just down. It, it, I felt miserable. I've given myself a bit of time to think about it. And, you know, because if I recorded the video, this part of the video then, I would have just been so miserable because I was so unhappy. But when I look back at it now, the fact that we got to the final of the Champions League and actually gave Real Madrid a run for their money as well. Real Madrid put us out last season, of course. If we have a look at our run to the final, we qualified automatically from the group stage. So I'll show the group table first. We finished sixth in that, qualified automatically, lovely jubbly, didn't need to have one of those horrible knockout playoff round games. Got through to the round of 16 and we got drawn against Juventus. We'd already lost to them in the league stage, but we drew 0-0 in the away leg and won 2-0 in the home leg. Then we got the quarterfinal where we had Bayern Munich. And at this point, I'm thinking, there's just no easy games in this. We're definitely going out here. And we got a 2-2 draw in the away leg. Uh, sorry, in the home leg. And won 1-0 in the, in the away game. Then in the semi-final... We got drawn against Napoli, who put Manchester City... Because that was my fear as well, is that we were due to play either Napoli or Manchester United. And if we play Man uh, sorry, Manchester City, and if we play Man City, Man City and Man United just beat us in pretty much every game we play. We might get the occasional draw, but we hardly ever win. And Napoli beat them. So we played Napoli, a 2-1 win in the home leg, a 1-0 win in the away leg as well which set up the final against Real Madrid and that happened. Real Madrid now are the 20 time winners of it, I think. 19 times, that might, yeah, still needs to tick over to the next day to register their 20th win. However, there is good news 
and we will now go to the Premier League table where, as you can see there, we've won the Premier League. We've actually gone and won the Premier League. We've won it by four points ahead of Liverpool. 83 points, which is a decent finish for us, to be fair, if we bring up the full table. 71 goals scored, 40 goals conceded, a goal difference of plus 31. Our form has, all season has just been pretty decent. Um, you know, we, we did lose nine games when you compare that to Tottenham, who only lost five, but they drew like 12. And I just, we've achieved step one of what we wanted from this road to glory save and what we want to do in bottoms up as well by winning the Premier Division. And we've actually done it with Avely. And if you'd said to me back at the beginning of November when we started bottoms up with Avely that in 15 years in game that I'd be going on to win the Premier League with them, I would have said you were mad. I, I, I really would have done. If we have a look at the schedule, you know what happened up till the 1st of January, which was here. You knew about the win against Sunderland. After that, in the Premier League, we picked up a 4-0 win against Burnley, Adam Bartlett getting a hat-trick. <clears throat> Leicester City then with a 1-0 win against them in the FA Cup. Then we had a 2-0 win against Bournemouth, but then we had a disappointing defeat, 3-2 against Chelsea. We then beat Arsenal 3-1. Now, this whole period here, I always felt if we could get through January, February, March and still be around the top of the table then we stood a chance because we knew from the first half of the season that the fixtures in the latter part of that first half were much more favourable. And we actually done pretty decently. We actually beat Man City, but this was in the FA Cup fourth round. Beat them 2-1. We beat by Leverkusen in the um, Champions League group phase. We did lose 3-1 to Real Madrid in the Champions League group phase as well. So they are becoming a bit of a nemesis of ours now, Real Madrid. West Ham, we beat 1-0. Brighton, we lost to them 2-1. But then a win against Tottenham, which at the time that was huge. They, they were either top or second in the table at the time. Then a 3-1 win against Fulham. Then we went out of the FA Cup to Liverpool 2-1. But then a win in the league 3-0 against Aston Villa. Then we had a really dodgy month. We lost to Juventus, oh, sorry, we drew to Juventus 0-0 at the start of March. Then we lost 3-0 in the league to Liverpool. And I really thought that was going to be the defeat that would end our title chances. Then a 2-0 win against Juventus in the home leg. 2-0 win, uh, sorry, a 2-0 defeat um, at home to Manchester City. Then a 2-2 draw against Newcastle. Then we had a 2-2 draw in the away leg against Bayern Munich. Then came a run of fixtures that was really rather favourable for us. So then we had Hull in the Premier League, which we won 3-0. Then we had the other game against Bayern. Then a 2-0 win and a 2-1 win against Wolves and Leicester. Then we had Napoli. In between the two Napoli games, we had a 1-0 win at home against bottom of the table, Birmingham. Then we had a 2-1 win against Everton. This game was so crucial because Manchester United had beaten Liverpool in a couple of weeks previously. And we knew that if we could get a win here, that we would be massive favourites to, or we would basically win the league. And we did. 2-1 win there against Manchester United. Then we followed it up on the last day of the league season with a 2-1 win against Sunderland. If we have a look at our squad, one disappointing thing about all this is that Anthony Geertz, who was due to... I was due to let him go and let him leave. He had a clause in his contract that if we... Um, avoid the relega avoid relegation and he plays in 10 or more games that he would get a one-year extension to his contract. So he's been extended by a further year. Um, and yeah, he, I mean, he, he made 20 starts and 14 appearances in the league. So we've used him quite a bit. Probably not too much of a bad thing that he stick around, but we do need some strengthening to do in the summer. So Chris McCausland will definitely be leaving. He will be going Bruce Pratt, we need to keep him away around because he's trained at clubs, so we'll offer it. He don't expire till next year anyway, but we'll offer him a new contract. If we have a look at appearances, obviously our goalkeeper, Leonardo Fernandez, 58 games he's played. I don't think our other goalkeeper made a single appearance. No, he didn't. Him and Daniel White not appearing all season. Then Miguel Neto in that holding midfield role, 57 starts, one substitute appear. He He's a beast. He really is. The fact that he's so reliable, he's never injured. He is always there. Three goals and two assists as well for the season. Noah Nicholson as well, same as him, 57 starts, one sub appearance, nine goals, one assist. That really picked up in the second half of the season because 
we were doing terribly from corner kicks and free kicks and Nicholson finally getting in on the habit. Bruno Carvalho as well has picked up five goals. They kind of rotate between us who they aim it to. And so 14 goals from their two centre-backs. Marvellous. Really can't complain about that. But yeah, then Lasana Harbour, he came to us to play on the left-hand side. He's now a right side for us. We we put him on the right-hand side. He started off, I think, three grey stars on the right-hand side. And when you look at him now, the son of Harbour's a three-star wing back on the right-hand side. He prefers playing there now. It's his preferred position. And he's a wonder kid for us. And it, you know, one of the few wonder kids we've got. Five-star potential. Everything's going in the right direction as far as he's concerned. Bruno Carvalho... Up there as well with the appearances along with Jovanovic, who's also been immense for us this season. An average rate of 7.01 across all competitions. Five goals, six assists. Let's have a look at who our top scorers are. <clears throat> and there's two players here that really do stand out, to be fair. Lorenzo Espirito Santo, who's had a lot of injuries this season. He's still made 40 appearances. 18 goals, three assists. An average rate of 6.96. If we have a look at his history, his 14 goals, he's getting less and less each season I am thinking of moving him on in the summer but let's see what happens it's not one of my highest priorities but then you get to um, Andre Bondarenko one of, and one of our new signings 16 goals and 10 assists at an average rate of 7.13 he has probably been our star player he really has he has been phenomenal you look at him in the league from 26 appearances 15 goal contributions from the 26 appearances just 35 million, very well spent, I think. Adam Barlow as well has had an outstanding season. He, he's really set. 56 appearances in total. 15 goals, 10 assists. Not all of those have been up top either. A lot of them have been in this midfield role. A couple have been out wide. But if we look at his history, he's never got close to doing this in the past. So his best season was his first season where he got nine goals and one assist. That's, you know, his average, average rating wasn't as good. But his average rate in last season was probably the best with eight goal contributions at 6.89. To now be on 17 goal contributions in the league at 7.11. He has had a really good season and definitely I think we keep him around for another season. Then you've also got Tangai Trove who's had a very good season as well. I mean, in terms of average rate and he's competing with Bondarenko. 11 goals, 12 assists. He has signed a new contract by the way. Um we eventually managed to get him to agree to the contract. I can't remember who the other guy was that we had issues. Oh, it was um, Diaz or Nunez, Nunez, that's it, Fabio Nunez, a 22-year-old, another wonder kid of ours, although he's not class of wonder kid now, but he was when he came with us, up, worth, got a value of up to 100 million. And yeah, he signed a new contract as well. So everything has looked really good this season. In terms of our other competitions that we've been in, the League Cup, Carabao Cup, whatever you want to call it. We went out very early in that. Where are we? There you go. Went out the fourth round to Manchester United. FA Cup, we went out, I think it was to Liverpool in the fifth round. We we almost won the Champions League, but we are Premier League winners. We do need to do an end of season review. Just quickly scout through all that. And I'll come back when we've got the end of season review ready. So here we are with the end of season review and we've got the Premier League trophy on our little screen here. Oh, that looks so good. I'm so happy we've won the Premier League. The pressure now is going to be on needing to win it again next season. Right, let's get into the end of season review. The new arrivals, transfers in. Bondarenko is our star signing. We've already been through what you can do. 50 million in total. 45 appearances. 26 goal contributions. 7.13. Matija Jovanovic from Severna Zvezda. I've said that completely wrong. 6.7. I mean, there's an argument to have that he is our best signing. At 6.75, getting a 7.01 and how good he's been. He's really... Him and Neto have really helped that midfield tick. If I can get someone to partner them them two for next season, rather than relying on McCausland, well, McCausland might be here, and Bartlett, that, they've done really well. Lasana. Um, Haber from Antwerp, 35 million. 10 goal contributions from him as a fullback for 56 games, 6.95. Luca Galina, 30 million from Fiorentina. He's been a bit of a waste, waste of money, really. He's not made a start for us. 48 
um, subs appearances, no goals or assists, 6.77. Andy Mendoza, 36.5 million. Waste about, I've wasted £66.5 million pound there. I need to do better in the transfer market this time round. Oh, we have also had a um, board takeover. I'm going to put an email on screen round about now to tell you about that board takeover. That's why none of these are being rated by the board. So, yeah, we'll have a look at that and we'll see... You'll see exactly what that email says. Basically, they're not going to invest in the club. So... It's of absolutely no use to me whatsoever. These are the players out. I mean, you and Todd, has, he's gone to Maidstone. I mean, that's that's how poor he is. He's had a great season at Maidstone, to be fair. 27, uh, 47 starts, 19 goals, 7 assists. 27-year-old winner. Fair play to him. Neil Lovell at Ebbsfleet. He's, been a, not, he's had a disappointing season. And, yeah, the rest of them have just gone well. They've gone. Jörg Lorenzi, 70 million, 46 appearances 14 goal contributions 6.86 they're certainly playing him at Liverpool Leroy Arias has also gone as well and yeah it is well it, he's gone to Palace Huggins has gone to Everton you see some of their more recent signings are going to bigger clubs than people like you and Todd that we picked up on a free transfer from Manchester City I think it was way back in I mean yeah I'm not even going to look at him. we're not going back to that then we've got how the season unfolded in the league, 6.125,000 home attendance, 100% field. We're not getting a new stadium. I've asked for a new stadium. They have agreed to improve the training facilities, but not the new, not a new stadium. Then we move on to moments to remember. Biggest win, a 6-0 win against Copenhagen. A 4-0 win against Burnley is a match to remember. And a 1-0 win against Bayern. Jovanovic with a goal. And it was a truly memorable goal from the Avery central midfielder as he hits a deftly executed finish from long range. It's worthy of goal of the month. Then we get into this part. We are now a four and a half star reputation club. We are worldwide, baby. Sponsorship has gone up significantly. Broadcast revenue has surprisingly gone down by about two million. Corporate and hospitality has gone up. Competition prize money has gone up. And match day commercial and retail has also gone up. We've had no new sponsorship deals. These are the shirts. We've sold some shirts, made like three million or whatever. Bondarenko, Nicholson, Jovanovic, Trove and Fernandez, who will hopefully all be sticking around next season in there. Uh, team of the year. Fernandez in goal. Nunes left back. Haber right back. Nicholson and Carvalho in the middle. Neto, Jovanovic and Bartlett in the midfield. Trove and Bondarenko out wide with Espirito Santo up top. Yeah, I agree with that. That's pretty much how it has been. He is, like I say, I thought not having a Lorenzi replacement was really going to hurt us, but he has really filled that gap quite nicely. McCausland has done well as also. Then we move on to the player awards. Tango Trove has got the fans player of the season. Tango Trove has also got the young player of the season at 24. That'll be the last time he can win that. Sign of the season, Bondarenko. Jovanovic with goal of the season. Espirito Santo, a top goal scorer of 18 goals. Anthony Gee, it's actually top assist with 12 goals. Adam Bartlett, most player in the match awards with six. Bondarenko, the highest average rating. And most passes completed per nine is Andre Bodo. I mean, he, he didn't play a great deal, but yeah, he got that. In terms of record breakers, Bruce Pratt is our top appearance person with 278 appearances for Avely. And he's been with us for a long time, Bruce Pratt. He... He's been with us on a free from Liverpool when we were in League Two. And he's stayed with us all the way through the Premier League and seen us win the Premier League as well. He's almost come as far on this journey as what I have. I won player, uh, Manager of the Season as well as the Manager of the Month Award. That's the final table. And Avery came along better than anyone would have expected and carried that mid-season form all the way to the title. And then you've got the Manager timeline that I don't really bother with. In terms of finances... We've got a transfer budget of 79.8 million. The wage budget is currently around 220,000 pound up or 220,000 pound left in the wage budget to spend. I do have players that I want to bring in. I have positions I want to fill and strengthen. If you look at our team here, you can probably see where we need to strengthen, but that will all be in the next video next Sunday at 2 p.m. Thank you very much for watching folks. Please leave a like on the video. We've won the Premier League. It's got to deserve a like. Leave a comment down below as well. And I'll see you next Sunday for the next Avery video. And don't forget, Monday, 6pm, 
bottoms up, as always, Monday to Friday. Thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye. Thank you.